welcome back to a bizarrely special man buddy where I'm teaching you life lessons in investing from um, my wife. While I'm not a dollar sign represented by a man or a stock symbol for that matter, ticker JIM, I've stumbled around the stock market long enough to learn a thing or two. So tonight, you're getting some of the wisdom from the school of hard knocks that I've been rolled in and passed. Don't you always love it at the beginning of a pro football game where they had the player say his name in a school and some say school of hard knocks? Well, that's what I attended when it comes to stocks. And you are getting the made for TV version right here, right now. For law school, I went to Harvard, though. We covered how I first got involved in the market, my fourth grade obsession with keeping a ledger to track stocks, and then ultimately learn how they trade through the greatest game on earth. No, not Monopoly, but Stocks and Bonds with its little certificates, its game board, and its cards about news that would send a stock higher or lower. I love that game. I left the stock market games behind by the time I got to middle school, which we called junior high back then, where my obsession became sports. I was the second fastest guy in the school forever. So I ran track, and then, of course, girls. Uh, who my teenage self found far more mystifying than the market. Maybe still do. Anyway, but that's the subject of a different show entirely. However, my father did ingrain in me the desire to save money. Early on, I learned that even in high school, I saved this. I bus tables at the old Block and Cleaver, which, of course, we called the Block and Cleavers because we were really funny and we were at the height of adolescent humor. I saved more working as a vendor at the old veteran stadium, selling first cold soda, then ice cold. That's how I did it. Hey, ice cold. I got ice cold soda here. Then I'll only graduating to sell an ice cream. Hey, I got ice cream, vanilla, and chocolate. Very quickly, I learned the value of market power, specifically cornering the market. And I paid people to give me the exclusive right to sell ice cream. Hey, ice cream here. On the 600 and then on the 700th level, which I own by keeping everybody else out of it. Can you imagine how much money you can be made if you had the only franchise in the whole upper deck? Well, at least it's the upper, upper deck, even for a team as horrible as the Phillies, which won almost no games. I made fortunes, except the one time they gave me strawberry ice cream. Talk about having to run from a customer after they sold you sold them that stuff. Or when Steve Carlton pitched because Lefty was on the mound. He got fired out so fast that I got stuck unsold ice cream. I had all this strawberry, and you can't take it home. Real bad. You had to buy it from the company before selling it, so I'd take a beating whenever Carlton was on the mound. That's a business lesson. Talk about learning how business really works. The shelf life of ice cream on a hot July night after the ninth inning is about as short as short can be. By the way, during the lightning round, I might jest with you about your name, calling you, hey, Skipper, hey, Captain, how you doing? Chief. I learned these names at the ballpark. It's what people called me to get my attention, to buy ice cream. Hey, Chief. And frankly, I loved it in its bizarre intimacy, and I never forgot the monikers, bud. I mean, partner. And that's why I use those terms on Man Bunny. Anyway, I made a ton of money at the advice of my father. I opened an account at Fidelity with the Magellan Fund. I contribute a little every week. It was the top, top performing mutual fund of its time, run by the great Peter Lynch, who's written two investment books, one up on Wall Street and Beating the Street, still available on Amazon. They are fabulous. Get them. I didn't save enough when I got to college. The money paid was work-study anyway, and it went toward my tuition room board. But when I got out of college and after multiple attempts to get a job in the newspaper business, I was rejected by 57 papers. I still have the rejections. I've saved every one of them. I hate everybody who rejected me. And, and, uh, never mind. I landed a position as a general sign reporter in Dallas. The Democrat crap making uh, 150 bucks a week. Uh, 150 bucks a week was not a lot to really kind of. Well, anyway, I still got a tattered pay stub. I've got it in an old wallet to remind me of how hard it was when I got started. Nevertheless, you know what? I still saved. I put a few dollars away when I could. A few dollars. I mean, like maybe four dollars. Not that long after that, I applied and got a job at the now defunct Los Angeles Herald Examiner. Now, it was a horrible job paying $179 a week. But as you can imagine, Los Angeles is more expensive than Tallahassee. Soon after my sojourn began in Los Angeles, I found this terrific bungalow apartment in what was known as the Fairfax District, right near Canners. Pretty sketchy, around the corner from Pioneer Chicken, which was way too expensive for me to go to. A few weeks later, I was stalked. My place was broken into repeatedly, something the cops were helpless to stop. At the same time, I was assigned a story in San Diego, a horrible shooting. Uh, and when I returned, everything was gone. Everything. Everything I had, including my checkbook, of which, of course, was cleaned out. So it began, my terrible but thrilling six months of living in my car, basically trying to get by. While my ultimate goal was to save enough to get an apartment, I was living hand to mouth. And people would take me in now and then so I could get a shower. That's really, it's really important to live in your car to get that shower. Or maybe even a good night's sleep. But you know what? I never quit saving. I remember cashing my paycheck every other week and then writing a check yes to Fidelity Magellan Fund for what I could afford. You only have your gasoline, car insurance, and food expenses if you're living in your car. Terrific saving on homeowners insurance, by the way, which was very expensive back then. News to say it was unsustainable. 
When I only came down with mononucleosis and then the attendant joined a sliver, yellow spot about the size of Greenland, you know, and those Mercado projectors on my stomach, I had no health care. The HMO my newspaper belonged to, I had no branch where I was at, at, at last station when the company mercifully put me on the road so I could at least submit some expenses for my day to day. So I had to go to a migrant farm workers clinic to get fixed up, and, and I still put money away, even then, even as I was making like, weekly trips to the doctor. It was one of the best I've ever had. But the upshot of investing is I, this is a challenge. The whole story is a challenge, and this is what it is. If I was living in my car and I invested, I never want to hear that you didn't see. Never. That's why I went through this. Amazing with the Magellan Fund back. Uh, back then, I was giving money to the best stock picker of all time. Fast forward 35 years later, I ended up taking advantage of one of the greatest bull markets in history. Magellan money ultimately amounted to a fund well into the six figures. Not because of my additional contributions, which, remember, only just a few dollars a month but purely from capital appreciation and the power of compounding. I never touched it, still have it. I just let it build. I think the takeaway here is that I want you to save, no matter what the excuse. Obviously, the earlier the better, through thick and thin. Listen, when CBC has those all-star managers on, keep your ear open. If you don't have enough money or to handle, or handle the, the time to own a stock portfolio, you can only own one or two stocks, send the money in, as little as money as you can, to a, an index fund, to, a money, to one of these big mutual funds. If you need help managing your own portfolio, join the investing club. I think that's the best way to go. And here's the real bottom line. If I could still send those checks to the Fidelity Magellan Fund when I was living in my car, sleeping in the back, Jack Daniels and a hatchet, and then ultimately a, yes, pistol, sick as a dog, joined a sliver, then what's your excuse for not getting started? You can put some money away, too. That's the way I was living. That money back in. Don't miss a second of Mad Money. Follow at Jim Kramer on X. Have a question? Tweet Kramer. Hashtag Mad Mentions. Send Jim an email to madmoney at cnbc.com or give us a call at 1-800-743-CNBC. Miss something? Head to madmoney.cnbc.com.